Hello everyone. Good morning, good evening, and possibly good night also to maybe some of us who are on the east side of the world. Um, you know, um, I and my co-chair uh, colleague Arun have a pleasure in introducing our guest speaker today, Mr. Rishikesh Krishnan. He has, uh, uh, I mean, uh, honestly, I, I, I am a little lost of words when I saw his profile and when Arun connected me with him. Um, you know, um, so he has done engineering, MBA and masters from top universities of the world, including India, including from the US like Stanford. Um, he is uh, currently a director and a professor uh, at one of the prestigious institutes uh, uh, in India. And um, he's a master of strategy and innovation, I may say. He has uh, books to his uh, credit. And, uh, you know, um, I think in all spheres of professional life, in whatever capacity he has been associated, I think strategy and innovation have been the core of uh, his, uh, from his expertise perspective. And I'm sure today's, uh, um, you know, session is also around one of those uh, pillars. Um, last but not the least uh, about uh, Rishi, as uh, we may, uh, uh, you know, uh, say about him. So he uh, is on the boards of several organizations. Um, a, a lot of them connected with the central government of India related to the payments, related to the financing. He is uh, also on the advisory board of many companies, I mean, including the ones I mentioned. Um, also um, um, advisory board on a, a venture capital company called Your Nest. Uh, it's a pre-Series A fund house focused on B2B deep tech companies. So, uh, I mean, uh, his, his credentials and accolades will go on. Of course, he has got he has been awarded uh, by many, many organizations. He himself has been a jury member uh, for the Startup Awards. Uh, Arun, please uh, let me know if I've missed anything. And my apologies, uh, Rishi, if there's something I might have said in error. Uh, the no, list goes on. I just said that uh, he's been uh, nominated as uh, one of the top uh, 50 thinkers of India uh, twice. Of if my memory serves correct, uh, Rishi. Yeah. Twice. So that's, uh, that's about it. Most of it is already what is already told by me. So we are very happy to have uh, Professor Rishikesh Krishnan with us today evening and uh, gain some insights and, uh, on practical. Uh, approach to innovation in connection with finance. Over to you, um, uh, Rishi. So, uh, everyone, I have pleasure in introducing uh, our guest speaker, uh, Rishi Kesh, uh, as Rishi, as we say. So, over to you, Rishi. Hey, thank you, Vineet, and thank you, Arun, and the greetings to all who are attending this session. Thank you. So, sir. it's a pleasure to be uh, with all of you today. Uh, uh, in spite of the fact that I've been on boards of several finance companies, I'm not a finance expert. So I'm, let me say, say that up front. So in case you are planning to ask me any tricky finance questions, I will defer it maybe to others. But maybe what financial studied, strategy may be a good point or topic <laughs> to ask. So what I've been uh, studying for a long time is innovation in organizations. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. But I have a specific objective in what I present to you today. I believe that uh, people who manage finance, for example, CFOs and others in senior finance positions in companies or financial advisors to companies, they also have an important role to play in supporting and encouraging innovation in the organization. Absolutely. And my focus in the talk today will be on how can the finance function be a catalyst for better innovation in the organization. So that's going to be uh, what I'll speak about. So just give me a couple of seconds to share my screen and uh, get uh, set up. And uh, then we'll be all set to go, I think. So I'm hoping you can see my screen now. Is a, Can you, Arun, is the screen visible? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Better. Okay, great. So I will get moving in that case. Uh, so this is a kind of overview of what I'm going to speak about today. As I already mentioned, uh, I think innovation is critical for any organization. And that's something most of you, I'm sure, will agree with. 
but my main thesis is that firms need to build what I'm calling a systematic innovation capability, which means that innovation is not something that happens sporadically or by chance, but it happens more by design. It happens more by uh, your intent. So how do you build a systematic innovation capability is a question I have been looking at for several years. And I believe it's a deliberate process that requires leadership. And of course, it also requires financial investment. So that's where the finance folks come into the picture. So my main argument today is that finance professionals have a key role in enabling the company to build a systematic innovation capability. So what I'll be doing in my presentation is I'll be walking you through what it takes a company to build a systematic innovation capability. And I will be periodically telling you what's the role of the finance function in either supporting or monitoring or managing the risk of this activity. So throughout my presentation, you will see some small red arrows. Wherever you see a small red arrow, that's where I'm going to give you some highlight about the role of finance. So this is broadly how I'm going to structure my presentation. So first, let me start with what is my definition of innovation? What are the definition I'll be using in the presentation today? So I'm talking largely about innovation in a corporate context. So in a corporate context, I will argue that most innovation starts with a particular problem or challenge as the starting point. For example, you're losing out to competition. Maybe your costs are too high. Uh, maybe uh, there's a big technological shift. You have some problem you need to address. If the solution to this problem is well known, you probably don't need innovation. But if the problem is a bit tricky, it's new, and then you need to come up with your own distinctive way of addressing that. So we come to the second step, which is about ideation. But ideation by itself is not innovation because ideas are relatively easy to generate. You need to do a lot of testing of these ideas. You have to refine them. You sometimes need to combine them in order to come up with the right solution. And we believe this whole process can be called innovation only if it finally results in some benefit or utility to an important stakeholder. Often the cu customer, but sometimes it could be an internal stakeholder as well. So just to sum up what I mean by innovation and what I'll be using as my definition going forward, is that innovation is applying new ideas to solve problems, resulting in benefits to users. So this is the definition I'm going to use. Now, what we all know, and I'm sure this is something we are very familiar with, is that innovation is changing rapidly. Traditionally, we looked at innovation in very simple terms. We talked about product innovation. We talked about process innovation. We looked maybe at a new customer experience or we looked at innovation in the business model. These were the four types of innovation which we looked at traditionally. But what's happening today is that innovation's scope is widening considerably. And here I'm talking about the impact of the digital technologies. So initially, we thought that the products that could be digitized, like music, books, movies, would be the arena where we would see a lot of innovation. But today we know that almost anything has become quasi-digital. The moment you put some sensors, you have Internet of Things, even machines and devices become literally digital act, uh, you know, entities communicating with each other. In fact, even a, a business like a service business is impacted by this kind of technological change. Traditionally, for example, how did uh, an insurance company decide the premium for a particular car driver? They essentially made some assumptions. They used some proxies. For example, if the individual was single, male, unmarried, and 25 years old, he had the maximum premium. At least in the US, that's how the premiums were determined. But today you can put a sensor in the driver's car and you can figure out what his driving behavior is like and you can actually measure how risky this driver is and you can fix the premium accordingly. So this is how digital technology has changed things. Of course, as we all know, when you add artificial intelligence and machine learning to this soup, you get a lot of extra things. You get embedded intelligence, self-learning, opportunities for alignment and customization, and so on. Now, we also know that processes have got transformed thanks to some interesting new technologies like robotic process automation, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. This is the first important insight for finance professionals. Traditionally, we thought that something like automation could be justified 
only if you had very large scale. It was generally believed to be something that went in tandem with very large volumes of production. But today what we are seeing in innovation in these areas is that some of those trade-offs between scale and cost and so on have got removed. Today, using robotic process automation, you could actually do a fair amount of automation even with smaller volumes and still not suffer very significant cost penalties. So this has changed the nature of innovation in companies. And this is something you might like to keep in mind as finance professionals when you look at major investments in innovation. Uh, innovation scope has also widened because we live in an experience economy. You're all familiar with, uh, you know, Ola cabs and Oyo hotel rooms and the equivalents in other countries. And of course, we have uh, artificial intelligence, sorry, we have augmented reality, virtual reality, which are enhancing the experience. So that again has widened the scope of uh, innovation. Uh, another important area, which is, of course, not a new area is business model innovation. And we've seen some very interesting cross subsidization models there. But we've also seen that the sustainability of some of these models sometimes comes into question. So this is the second thing I wanted to underline for finance professionals. You know, initially we thought that many of these online companies, they would be able to continue to subsidize customers for many years to come. But we've already seen with the tightening of the markets that that kind of tolerance for, you know, taking huge losses on an indefinite period is no longer there. So clearly, you know, even something like business model innovation has really got to finally be sustainable if it's going to work in the long run. So that's, that's an important thing to keep track of if you're a finance professional. We also know that from automation, many companies are now moving to what we call augmentation. That is remembering that automation can only take you so far, but you still need human intelligence to customize, to meet customer needs better, just to be in aligned and in sync with the customer. But the broad message I want to give you is that today, innovation has much wider scope than it has before. And therefore, almost any company needs to be in close pursuit of innovation if it wants to be successful. Which brings me to the next question, which is the big question. How do you go about building a systematic innovation capability? And first of all, why is this important? We know that many companies innovate, but Companies sometimes seem to innovate by chance. It's not something that's been part of their strategy or that's been part of a very deliberate effort. What happens as a result is that you don't know when innovation is going to happen and you're also not able to get maximum value out of innovation. So it really helps if you can make innovation a part of your DNA. That's what we are calling building a systematic innovation capability. Now, what are the challenges to building a systematic innovation capability? Uh, we talked to a lot of companies some years ago when we were writing this book called Eight Steps to Innovation. And what we found is that there are three sets of challenges that companies face in building a systematic innovation capability. The first one is building a pipeline of ideas. Somehow they find that, you know, there are not enough ideas getting generated. And as we already saw in the definition, ideas are the key raw material for innovation to happen. Another set of companies, however, told us that it's not about generating ideas. In fact, generating ideas is easy. The big challenge is how do you take those ideas forward? How do you prevent the ideas from getting stuck or lost or just not acted upon? So the challenge, in other words, is how do you create idea velocity? And the third set of companies told us, you know, we actually develop a lot of ideas. We even have organizational processes that take them forward. But our challenge is we are not good at converting those ideas into successful innovation. Uh, to use a cricket metaphor, we are saying basically your batting average is not good. You're not converting, you know, or maybe you should say strike rate would be even better today. I would say if you're a cricket player, you would say you want to have your much better strike rate. You want to be able to convert more of those ideas into successful innovation. So what we realized is that if you want to build a systematic innovation capability, you need to do these three things. You need to be able to build a good pipeline. You need to be able to improve the velocity of your ideas. And you need to be able to improve your batting average or strike rate. So the big question now is how do you do this? So the rest of my talk today is going to be about how you go about building this systematic innovation capability. And as I said, I'm going to bring in 
those elements of this process where finance plays an important role and what all of you as finance professionals need to keep in mind when you're looking at this uh, challenge. So I'm going to start by talking about the first step, which is laying the foundation. What is laying the foundation all about? Laying the foundation essentially means that you need to link your approach to innovation and your innovation priorities to the strategy of the company. Now, I know that many of you as financial prof finance professionals get involved in strategy with CEOs, with uh, other CXOs, and you play an important role, particularly in looking at the financial returns that we are likely to accrue from that strategy. Now, one of the important aspects of strategy, in my view, is also making sure that what you're doing on the innovation front is aligned with what your strategic goals and priorities are. So as a CFO or a financial advisor, I would urge you to ask the CEO when discussions about the strategy come up, do you have a good innovation strategy that is aligned to the overall strategy of the company? Let me give you an example to make this clear. So uh, I, I, for our international participants, just a quick introduction, Tata Steel is one of India's oldest and most successful steel companies. It's a part of the Tata conglomerate. It's been around for, I think, more than 100 years. Uh, but if you look at the current strategy of Tata Steel, their vision is to be the leader in digital steel making by 2025 through adoption of digital technologies. And this is what they look at as the way to transform Tata Steel. And of course, the goals they're seeking are partly financial goals, right? One big goal is substantial improvement in their EBITDA, but they're also looking at whether they can enhance digital maturity and whether they can make their company an agile, insightful, and intelligent organization. So this is a good example of a company which is very clear that, you know, uh, once upon a time, they had a motto saying, we also make steel, suggesting that they were a very socially sensitive company. Today, they are not saying we also make steel, Today, they're saying they want to be a leader in digital steel making. And I think that is essentially talking about how you bring digital technologies into the entire steel making process. So this is a good example of a company, to my mind, that has a good alignment between its overall strategy and the kind of innovation that it's trying to do. So what does it mean to lay a foundation for innovation? Essentially, you've got to create what we would call an innovation program, which essentially means that you need to determine what kind of innovation you will do, how you will do it, and so on. One way of looking at this is to think of innovation in three parts, the core, the adjacent, and the transformative elements of innovation. So what this essentially means is that the core innovation is incremental innovation based on existing products, services, or processes. For example, a company like Monsanto uses machine learning models to predict market demand which essentially helps them reduce their inventory across products. Or it could be adjacent where you're looking at either new products for existing customers or new markets for existing products. Typically, you'll find a lot of internet companies doing this. They already have a huge network of customers, so they try to build on additional products or services they could offer to them. And then finally, you have transformation kind of innovation where you're betting on the next big thing. It's long-term, high-risk. It's like companies which are talking about, well, driverless cars, I guess, is not a big thing anymore, but it's now about flying cars and things like that. But what is the important aspect of this for all of you as finance experts? The important thing for you to see as finance experts is that the way companies invest money in innovation is rapidly changing because of the technological changes we are seeing, including the ones I described to you earlier. So traditionally, companies spent about 70% of their resource devoted to innovation on the core stuff, that is incremental innovation, 20% on looking at either new products or you know, just looking at new markets, and only 10% on the transformational part. But what we are seeing today is that digital technology is changing the way companies are looking at that. And we are seeing an almost even split between core and the adjacent and transformational. So this is something you might like to keep in mind when you, again, talk to the CEO or CFO. You might want to make sure that they are recognizing the fact that you need to be investing a lot more 
in the adjacent and transformational kind of innovation and not only putting all your money into the core innovation the company is looking at. What's also emerging is that companies are using a lot of alternate structures to achieve their innovation objectives. So you could either use a very typical corporate model, old corporate model, where you have a centrally funded R&D entity that does most of the R&D, and of course interacts both with internal and external sources. But what's more likely is you'll have what's in the middle. You'll have a you know, unit R&D, that is each business unit will be doing its old R&D, but you'll have a centralized digital innovation platform that provides innovation methodologies, processes, training, and connects to external sources. So most companies today are investing in this. So once again, if you are looking for a good idea of what companies should be investing on, most companies are realizing that in the digital era, it's not enough to have that uh, just R&D in each unit. You also need to be providing a whole lot of digital support in terms of methodologies and processes that will enable the company to innovate better. Or of course, you could have independent innovation labs, which is again, largely a pretty old kind of an approach. So just to uh, sort of close this discussion on, on this particular aspect, you'll find that companies today are actually providing a whole lot of internal services. For example, this gentleman here, uh, Cyril Padukat, he used to be the uh, EVP in Schneider Electric. And when he was in Schneider Electric, he said that, you know, he, they set up things in such a way that they could provide both business consulting capabilities and technology expertise to their businesses so that they could co-innovate with the businesses in terms of digital office, just like that second model I just showed you a couple of minutes ago. What's also been quite apparent now is that for innovation to happen fast, it is important that all areas within the company are aligned. So that means legal, compliance, security, all of these need to be aligned with each other. And the reason is quite obvious. The reason is that increasingly in a digital era, there are lots of unknowns in the security thing. There's cybersecurity issues. There are new regulations coming in. For example, you have all the challenges with GDPR in Europe. You have many countries now coming up with new data protection laws like in India. So you've got to make sure that all these different functions are acting in alignment, in concert with the business in order to take innovation forward. What's also the interesting is that if you want innovation to happen, it's probably got to be fed through the platforms that employees are already using. For example, this gentleman was earlier the CIO of Monsanto and Bayer, and he says it's not enough if you just have a model. You've got to embed that model into people's work. For example, if the sales reps are using Salesforce as their tool, then you've got to make sure that whatever these digital innovations are happening actually happen through the Salesforce platform. So this is one of the challenges that people are looking at. And what's also important, and here again, I think there's an important lesson for uh, all the finance professionals is you've got to make a significant investment in core technologies if you want to make all these digital innovations happen. For example, going back to Tata Steel, the example I gave you earlier, they realized that cloud data and AI are the core engines they're using for technology. So they need to augment the network, cloud, and cybersecurity infrastructure they have. They need to have a clear maintenance technology roadmap. And they also need asset monitoring and a diagnostic center for remote monitoring. So you will need to make all these investments, significant though they may be, if you're going to drive you know, innovation in this kind of a digital uh, space. What's also important is that you put in place some basic processes. One important process is what we call idea management. Idea management essentially means that you need to make it easy for people within the organization to share their ideas with the company. And typically we say you need to be clear about six things. You need to be clear about the source of the ideas. You need to be clear about the scope of the ideas. Are these incremental or are they large impactful ones? You need to be clear about how many stages the idea has to go through before it is approved or funded. You also need to be clear about how you're going to collect ideas, what's the technology you're going to use. But there are two things here which are very important for all of you as financial professionals. And that's how you go about selecting the ideas and how you go about funding the ideas. For selection, increasingly what we are finding 
is that companies are preferring to use open transparent methods that take advantage of the expertise inside the company. For example, many times they're using cloud, sorry, not crowd-based solutions, not cloud, crowd-based solutions, so that they get the involvement of everybody in the organization to vote on ideas and decide which are the best ideas. So it's the wisdom of the crowd is what is being used in a big way. And the other thing you might like to keep in mind is that many companies realize that unless you have funding aligned with the innovation activity, there's no point in doing a whole lot of ideation. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I had gone to the R&D center of Ericsson here in Bangalore. Ericsson is a big telecom company. And they had a very simple system. If your idea met certain criteria, you automatically got two things. You got a voucher for $500 and you got a week off from your job. Let me repeat, voucher for $500 and a week off from your job. Now, these were not to go on a vacation, by the way. These were to help you work on the idea and develop it further. So the $500 was in case you needed to hire an intern. The week off was so that you aren't burdened by your regular uh, job, everyday job. So essentially making this kind of funding available is something very important to making the innovation process work. So I, this is not the stage where, you know, you could probably be asking for detailed ROI calculations. This is early stage ideas, but what you are really hoping to do is get people to demonstrate the utility of their ideas, maybe get a proof of concept. And it's very important that the finance function realizes the importance of this kind of ideation and makes money available for funding this without you know, quite expecting the rigorous ROI calculation that you might expect to see at a later stage of the innovation process. So companies have, have been doing this kind of thing for many years now. Let me give you a good example of one of the world's leading digital banks, DBS Bank, which is based in Singapore. Piyush Gupta is the CEO of DBS Bank. And he had a big drive to get employees to contribute ideas. And you can see here the data, right? Thanks to the process improvement ideas that came from employees, something like 240 million hours of customer wait time was eliminated. So this is the kind of potential you have if you can actually put in place a good idea management system. The second thing you would like to do as part of this foundation is to create a lot of excitement or buzz around innovation. You want to run innovation campaigns, for example, internally. Uh, one of my favorites is an Indian watch company called Titan, which also makes jewelry. And one of the big campaigns they ran a few years ago was called Simplify and Automate, where they got people within the organization to come up with suggestions on how the whole jewelry manufacturing process could be automated. Uh, this was a very successful campaign. In fact, uh, the ideas they got from this resulted in millions of dollars of cost and process saving. Then last but not the least, you want to probably spend some time on training and development. This is another fascinating area. I mean, traditionally we've always had this debate. Are people born innovators or do they, are they become innovators? Yeah. What is pretty clear is that some amount of training for innovation can actually make a difference. And that's what companies like Titan are doing. They're spending good amount of resources on training people to build creative problem solving capabilities. So I would suggest to all of you in the finance domain, this is also a good place for you to put in your investment. Remember that innovation capabilities also need to be built. So you need to create, for example, digital fluency or other kind of capabilities that would enable your employees to do a lot more innovation. So even a company like Tata Steel that I spoke about earlier is doing a whole lot in terms of awareness building, general capability development, deep tech skill development, et cetera. And they're doing all of this through creating e-learning and training platforms that enable the employees to pick up the skills that are required. Okay, I'm sorry, I've been speaking a bit fast. So let me just stop here, pause here for a moment. Let me see if you have any questions or any comments on what I've spoken about uh, so far. So I'll, let me just pause here for a moment. Uh, if I may ask uh, Rishi, uh, there's a yeah. question from uh, one of our uh, uh, participants today. Uh, he It's in uh, with respect to uh, innovation uh, in connection with M MSME. SME space, 
So uh, is there anything uh, particular happening in the SME space? Is a question from Mahesh Krishnamurthy. And I have a few questions. Uh, so, you know, the MSME space uh, anywhere in the world is quite a broad category. So, you know, India has literally millions of micro, small and medium enterprises. And they're certainly not a homogeneous group. So uh, I think there are you know, hundreds, if not thousands of MSMEs, which are doing a lot of very innovative things. But there are also many others who are unfortunately caught in a rut where a lot of innovation is not happening. So if you look at, for example, the startup ecosystem in India, which is in a way, at least when they start, they're all MSMEs. There's a pretty good amount of innovation happening. But overall, yeah, I think there are challenges the MSME sector faces, resources, people, um, revenues, things like that. Also in India, there have been some external shocks. So all of that together, I think, has uh, maybe pushed them back a little. But there are several very interesting, very innovative MSMEs as well. Uh, does, uh, so uh, in connection with the Mahesh question and your answer, uh, on the one hand, you say that uh, startups are innovative, which is actually micro MSME, uh, if you can uh, you know, label them that way. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you say uh, the SME space part of it, they are not too successful. Is it because that they are already in existence in, a, uh, uh, in the business and then uh, they are not able to think out of the box and then uh, as a startup with a few individuals, the same at a very low scale, they are able to do uh, innovation since it's a, a new thing which they try to experiment. So Arun, I think many SMEs have got into a rut. The reason they've got into a rut is, you know, many times they would have started as a supplier to a large company. You know, in India, we used to use a phrase called ancillary. And, uh, you know, there's a particular requirement they are meeting on a regular basis. But then what's happened in many industries is while that continued for many years, suddenly the buyer, the buyer's requirements changed, the buyer's technology changed, and the SMEs were not able to quickly adapt to these uh, changing requirements. So I think they got sort of in a way a little complacent. They got used to meeting these steady standard requirements. And in a way, maybe they lost the zeal for innovation, which they had uh, when they first started. So that's, I think, one of the challenges that uh, these guys are uh, facing. And sometimes, of course, the technological change may be so significant okay. that it's not easy for them to move into the new technology space. And, uh, Hanuman uh, would like to know uh, more about, Hanuman Sharma would like to know more about uh, how digital steel making really works? How does it work? Is it uh, too long to explain? If you can, or you like uh, to make Sorry, yeah. Steel. Good evening, Vishy. Uh, so I have been hearing this green steel making. Now you have put the Tata steel vision of digital steel making. So so far I have been uh, hearing green steel making is the vision. Now digital steel making. So if you can okay. elaborate a little. Yeah, digital steel making. I think is just saying that we are going to use technology to make the steel processing, sorry, steel manufacturing process more efficient. So the moment you put in more digital technology, you put in AI, you put in machine learning, you start, for example, making your plant uh, logistics more efficient, you put in digital supply chains, all of this essentially, they of course involve significant investment, but they bring down the cost of many of the manufacturing processes. And that's what digital steel making is all about. So the core process may not very much. It may still be the same old blast furnace, but the blast furnace will now have a whole lot of digital tools to manage the process and make the whole production more efficient. A green steel making is essentially talking about environmental impact. At some level, digital steel making and green steel making may have some things in common. Because uh, digital steel making will, again, as I said, increase efficiency. So for a given degree of input, it will enhance the output, which is also good for the environment because it means that you're using less resources. So there's some overlap between green steel making and digital steel making, but otherwise the focus is a bit different. Green is on looking at sustainability and environmental impact and 
digital is looking at using technology to improve efficiency. Yeah, makes Anushi, sense. Thank you. Anushi, I have a question with respect to the slides you have presented. Uh, uh, see, in the first slide, we started off uh, with uh, the base uh, framework uh, in terms of first, uh, you need uh, the problem statement uh, to be defined. And then uh, further, then the idea has to be generated and then the funnel uh, to be uh, rapidly moved upon for the ideas. And then so in this process, uh, it's heavily oriented. My questions are two questions. One is, uh, does it, uh, is it uh, again a top down uh, kind of innovation that uh, whatever is the uh, um, actual uh, experience in the industry? or has uh, things moved away from the top down and then now you have different stakeholder uh, requirements you know the, 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 the company's uh, responsibility is uh, you know is divided to uh, multiple stakeholders so do they uh, do they consider the other stakeholders uh, to look at solutions uh, say for example problems with the, the social community the entity is involved with uh, to solve any problem with respect to that does it come into play second part of the question is the entire tilt is uh, supposedly on the employees uh, to generate ideas ultimately with the help or without the help of consultants so does it may involve a, um, a huge uh, cost in terms of any special training to employees or um, do have some kind of uh, <laughs> minimum bar to uh, for the employees you know while picking them have been issued at the beginning you, you know, specify certain uh, pre uh, pre uh, prerequisites uh, which you believe would be required how how does it work I'm, if i'm wrong you can correct me but uh, is it my these are the yeah, so the general trend is towards what is called democratization of innovation so you, you would remember when I talked about the three challenges, the first one I talked about was building a pipeline. Yeah. And one of the reasons you don't have a pipeline is often because innovation is a restricted activity undertaken by just a small group of people. So if you want more ideas to come in, you've got to open up the innovation process. To give you a simple example, who are the people in the company who are closest in contact with customers? They're typically the salespeople, and support and service people. But typically who does the innovation in company? It might be R&D and engineering folks. But if you don't get the inputs from the sales and support people, if you don't involve them in the innovation process, you're losing out a lot of very valuable insights which they bring as a result of their interaction with the customers. So the overall philosophy today is that you need more people to be involved in the innovation process. You don't want it to be only top down because the management or the leadership is not the only one who has good ideas, uh, but you want to make uh, the innovation process more participative. And uh, that's really the philosophy which we think most uh, organizations uh, should adopt. Sure. So Arun, Rishi, with your have... permission, yeah, yeah. I'll, maybe I'll just Sorry, take one just... more question. And yeah, just I'll one last question because, uh, from my yeah. side, Rishi. So I've received a question. Uh, it says, what specific contribution does a CFO really make in the boardroom when the subject matter of the discussion relates to business and not finance? Because, you know, maybe, I mean, the, the, the logic of this question may be, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, because the uh, discussions are more from a vision and a business perspective, and CFO being a finance guy. So do you have some like thoughts because you have been part of so many advisory boards? Yeah, so I mean, at a broad level, I would say that uh, a good CFO is not only a good finance professional, a good yeah. CFO also understands enough about the business to make meaningful contribution to the strategy. And, uh, you know, often the CEO does depend on the CFO for good insights, not only into how to manage finance better, but also as a sounding board for a lot of business uh, decisions. So I would argue that a good CFO today uh, cannot afford to be just a finance expert. Uh, he or she also needs to have uh, enough understanding of business and 
some of the strategy aspects so that their contribution can be more significant. So, thank you. Please okay, with it. your permission, I'm going to go forward because I'm Please. also a little conscious of the time and yeah, yeah I know thank that you so much. We, yeah. Appreciate that. We don't have so much time yet. So, uh, so let me just uh, move forward. Uh, so the first thing I was talking about was the laying the foundation. The second important step in building a systematic innovation capability is creating what we call a challenge book. So there are many possible areas in which you could innovate, but how do you know which of these you should choose? So where should your innovation investments be focused? Now, if I were to ask one of you, you'd probably say it's probably in that area which will give you best ROI or some, some equivalent measure. That's probably what you would say. But when you look at it from an innovation perspective, looking at what are the best problems to solve, there's some other dimensions we would recommend that you also look at. Uh, so we have three important uh, criteria which we use to figure out whether a problem is a good problem for innovation. First one, does it reflect the pain point of an important stakeholder? Second one, does it represent some wave or trend? And third one, does it reflect some waste of resources? So the, which basically means there's inefficiency embedded in the system. And our key argument is that when you have all these three, when you have pain, wave and waste, that's probably a good opportunity for you to look at uh, innovation. So I'm gonna take you back to Tata Steel. So Tata Steel uh, has a huge uh, steel plant in Jamshedpur. Of course, they have big steel plants in other places as well. And one of the things they realized is that there's a lot of inefficiency within their steel plant itself in the sense that there's trucks getting held up, there is logistics uh, problems, this turnaround time of trucks is long. And of course, there are other challenges beyond. Once the truck leaves the steel plant and takes the steel towards the customer, once again, there are all sorts of problems. Sometimes there's theft, sometimes there are breakdowns. Essentially, what they realized is that if you can have greater visibility of logistics and uh, transportation, both within the plant area and outside, you would be able to really make this process more efficient. So what they did is they collaborated with a predictive logistics software as a service platform, and they tried to figure out how they can improve the efficiency of this whole thing. For example, they automated vehicle compliance checks. They did real-time tracking and routing. They had a whole lot of uh, IoT, AI, and other kinds of dashboards. And of course, they are very good results. But the reason I'm giving you this as an example is basically there was an important pain point. There was a delay in loading trucks. There was congestion. There were forced crew diversions. There was theft. Final result, delayed deliveries. There's an important wave. The wave is that, you know, there are new technologies like IoT and machine learning, which are transforming the way you can manage many of these processes. And of course, there's waste because all this inefficiency, you are having inefficient utilization of trucks, which was having a negative impact on operations of the customer. So by addressing this problem through this big tech solution, Tata Steel was able to improve their operational visibility almost 100%. They were able to reduce theft by more than 50%. They were able to do about 30% reduction in loading and unloading turnaround time. And Arun, in response to your earlier question, they also were able to engage a lot of other stakeholders for collaboration opportunities. So a whole lot of things they managed to achieve through this very big innovation at the organizational level. What I also want to underline to all of you today is that, you know, we used to think that if you want to understand a customer well, you need to go and spend a lot of time with the customer. You need to immerse yourself in the customer's activities. But interestingly, today, there's actually an alternative to that. You could, through tracking data flows, you could actually get a lot of the information you require in order to do innovation. So you look at a company like Bajaj Finance. It's a non-banking finance company. It used to be essentially doing finance for Bajaj vehicles. But today they're one of the largest personal and consumer finance companies in the country. And they're doing all of that because they're just very good at collecting and uh, analyzing data. They've issued uh, millions of credit cards and what they call EMI cards to customers. So they're able to look at people's credit behavior. And they also buy data from third party uh, providers like Equifax. They put all of this data together and they're able to make very good assessments of what the loan they should give the customer. And they're able to create a whole lot of other customized products for their loan customers as well. 
So all of this is happening actually without, you know, the traditional method of immersing yourself physically in the lives of customers, but just tracking the data. The third important thing you might like to look at is building participation. Now you remember, I just mentioned a few minutes ago that innovation today is all about democratizing the innovation process, making more people participate. So there are three or four important methods companies use to improve participation. One is they identify good role models so people can get inspired by. Second thing is they try to set up some of their employees as innovation catalysts. These are managers and supervisors who encourage and motivate others to innovate. But two of these activities are important for all of you finance folks. One is creating effective communities of practice. What's a community of practice? It's a group of people who come together of their own volition, of their own accord, because they're interested in a particular domain. And the, what the company has to do is provide them some time and space so that they can do their brainstorming and collaboration and all the rest. So the company's role in this is limited. It's not in mandating them to innovate, but it's in providing them the flexibility of time and space. So I would again argue that, you know, as a finance professional, you might be a little suspicious of these kind of activities, but they're very important for generating ideas. So that's why I wanted to just underline this. The other way of building participation, of course, is through rewards and recognition. Now, this is a huge topic and, you know, we could have had the whole session just on rewards and recognition, but I would like to just leave a couple of things for you to think about. As a CFO or as a financial advisor, you would often have to approve allocations for these kind of reward mechanisms. But one of the things you might want to keep in mind is there's something called Goodhart's law, which basically says when a measure becomes a target, it's no longer a good measure. For example, if the company says, I'm going to measure you on number of nails you make, then people will try to make smaller and smaller nails so that they reach that target. <laughs> on the other hand, if the company says, I'm going to measure you on the weight of nails you make, you'll try to make a few giant heavy nails. Uh, by the way, this is not a joke because some of you might know that just a few years ago, there was a big challenge that Wells Fargo faced where, you know, internally they set a target that employees need to get a lot of new accounts open. And finally, it was found that employees opened millions of fake accounts and Wells Fargo was fined about $185 million by the regulators. So this is a good hearts law in action. This basically says that be careful when you set these targets and metrics and incentives and so on. Because if you don't set them right, you might actually have perverse consequences. So this is something you might just like to keep in mind as you go forward. Okay, now, so far I was talking about laying the foundation, but you remember that there's a second important thing, which is the, how do you enhance the velocity? So we were first talking about how do you build a pipeline? Now we are talking about how do you enhance idea velocity? Uh, idea velocity is all about experimentation. You don't know if an idea is a good idea unless you try it out. So the big challenge for most organizations is how do I make it easy for people to try out ideas? Uh, so that means you need to do a lot of experimentation. Uh, it could be like if you are in a ride hailing company like Lyft, maybe you want to get people to change their behavior. You want them to shift from say Tuesdays, which are a dull day to Friday evening so that you have more availability of cars. So one of the questions is how do you influence drivers to take up that Friday evening shift? One option is that you uh, show them how much more money will they'll make. The other option is you show them how much money they are losing by sticking with Tuesdays. So if you have any understanding of behavioral economics would have immediately realized that it's the second option which works better. So essentially people are, have a high degree of loss aversion. They dislike losing much more than they like gaining. So it really helps if you take that loss aversion approach. But even if you didn't know behavioral economics, you could do an experiment to fight, try this out. So the key is you need to have a lot of experimentation in the company, which also means that you need to keep a few things in mind. You need to remember that failure plays a critical role in innovation. So if I was a CFO, I certainly wouldn't penalize failure because I would realize that I need to encourage people to fail, not by repeating the same mistake, but by honest failure, that's the only way you're going to have innovation. Uh, you need to create enough infrastructure and resources for experiments. So when you're making all that CapEx, it's not good enough if you make CapEx in plant and machinery. You want to make capital investments in 
infrastructure to do experiments because without experiments, there's no innovation. So you have to make that investment. And you also want to encourage people to do the most tricky experiments first. In other words, the experiments which are going to test the most critical assumptions, you need to make do those experiments as early as possible. So from a risk mitigation point of view, this is an important thing you need to keep in mind from the finance function. When somebody is presenting their innovation plan, you would probably like them to identify the most critical assumptions early and test out those assumptions as quickly as they can. You also want to make sure that you are supporting both convergent and divergent uh, experimentation. Convergent experimentation is like AB feature testing. Divergent experimentation is like more open-ended stuff, putting a prototype in the hands of customers and allowing them to do a whole lot of experimentation. And you might also like to remember that in today's experimentation driven world, the role of the leader is very different. The role of the leader is not to back hunches or practice intuition, but it's to facilitate people doing experiments in the company and making sure that experiments and data are the way decisions are taken. So the role of the leader is as the chief experimenter, or I would prefer to say the chief orchestrator of experiments. You also want to make sure that once a proof of concept is established, there's enough investment available to scale it up. So you probably want to identify who are the good judges or good champions of innovation in the organization, whose judgment you could rely on in order to put the investment behind those ideas. This is something I would underline very strongly because there will always be a leap of faith you need to take in scaling something up. So you want to make sure that that idea has the right backers before you uh, support it. And also remember that today's world, iterating on the business model is as important as iterating on technical ideas. Iterating on the business model is where a lot of the uh, you know, new methods of getting value out of your innovation become visible. So as a CFO, I would also urge you to encourage the management team to keep experimenting with the business model till they find the right one, which really makes sense for the company. Okay, I'm gonna just quickly speed up and finish the presentation in the next three minutes so that we then open it up for those of you who are, can stay on for a bit for some more questions. So the final thing we want is to enhance the batting average. There are various methods we can use. We can use what are called a sandbox, which is a kind of safe space for deep experimentation. We can encourage the company to look at more platforms so that you can basically manage your risk across multiple products. And increasingly, and I think Arun, you were referring to this earlier, you might want to encourage a lot more open innovation. Today, most companies are finding that a good way of innovating is to collaborate with startups. Companies like Cisco have very structured innovation programs. But as the CFO, one thing you might like to keep in mind is when you are in a meeting where this kind of startup engagement is talking, being talked about, make sure the startup engagement is business driven, not technology driven because that's the way you will get the kind of business results that you're looking for from the engagement with the startup. So this is an important element to keep in mind. Also remember that you need to build a whole lot of capabilities in order to partner well with startups. I would strongly recommend that you read this book called Gorillas Can Dance by a friend of mine, Shamin Prashantam, who is at the China Europe International Business School in Shanghai. Basically, he talks about what it takes for a large company to collaborate with small companies. And once again, what you will find here is you need to invest in building those capabilities. You need individuals have those skills. You need to bring in specialized individuals for this process. And unless you build those capabilities, you won't be able to do it. So please do support and encourage investments in building those kind of interface capabilities within the organization. The final point is that risk management is key to managing innovation well. As uh, finance professionals, you have an important role to play in managing risk. So one of the things you might like to emphasize to the organization you're working with is that they need to do a very good risk analysis of their innovation ideas very early in the day. In fact, you should encourage them to do what is called a pre-mortem. A post-mortem, of course, you all know, right? Something goes wrong, you try to find out what happened. 
but a pre-mortem is turning the post-mortem logic in its head. It's basically saying, can I anticipate all the things that could go wrong? It's a bit like the risk factors in your IPO prospectus, right? But this is a, a set of uh, risk factors that you develop by doing a very in-depth analysis of all the possible ways in which your innovation could flop. And interestingly, you know, Boeing is one company which has had two major challenges in the last decade. They launched an air, aircraft called the Dreamliner, which had a lot of problems with its uh, you know, electric system. Then they launched another product called the Boeing 737 Max, which again had two catastrophic accidents and was grounded for a couple of years. And if you actually go back and look at the development of these two products, you could have, you will see that perhaps they, if they had done a more careful pre-mortem, they might have been able to anticipate many of the challenges they face later. Okay, so let me just come to the last slide, which basically says that these are the eight steps. I think finance professionals have a role to play in many of them. Money is obviously an important input to the innovation process. And as I identified for you in many steps, there are important role all of you can play in both facilitating and making sure that innovation is a more well-managed or a better managed process uh, within the organization. So sorry for taking a little longer than I probably should have, but I will stop here and I'm happy to take uh, any other questions that you may have. Thank you, Rishi. Uh, I'll just, while I wait for others to type in the chat box, I have a few questions of my own, if you will permit me. Vineet, I will uh, take the few, if you can, uh, while we wait for others. So, yeah, so Vineet, uh, uh, sorry, Arun, by the way, there are lots of questions coming in the chat now, so just keep track. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay. So, uh, in specific uh, to the slide on the Drivers, you know, uh, CFOs are very, uh, our uh, primary responsibility is today is to be, uh, be a business partner, uh, uh, be a team player. So in that kind of roles, uh, the uh, most important task would be to identify the drivers of the business, be it uh, cost drivers, you know, or uh, revenue drivers, there may be multiple drivers. So when you pointed out uh, a measure, which is essentially a driver, uh, would you clarify, you know, help us, uh, you know, uh, uh, how to uh, how to make it a success, you know, uh, whatever precedent you identified and then uh, described the failure of uh, the failure at uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, we cannot afford to have such a failure, we cannot have such a cost. So how to uh, solve this dilemma, you know, because uh, the drivers are very important because everything will be focused on the multiple drivers uh, for the business. So your thoughts please on that. So I think uh, uh, it's, a, it's a challenging question, Arun. So I think you have to be careful about cause and effect and what is the final thing you are looking for. So you need to have a whole lot of intermediate measures. So maybe a good way to think of this is to think of it with a tool like the balance scorecard. So if you remember the balance scorecard, essentially you're looking at uh, certain financial outcomes. Now those financial outcomes will happen as long as there are certain intermediate things that happen. That's why the balance scorecard looks both at internal business process measures and customer related measures as real time metrics of what's going on in the organization. So you probably want to be, so you, you might not want to therefore, you know, uh, wait till the financial results come out, you want to make sure that you have the right intermediate measures, but you also want to be sure that you have the right cause and effect relationships mapped out. In other words, that the right intermediate measures uh, or you're measuring the right intermediate measures that lead to the outcome you're looking for. So that, that involves a little challenge, of course, but you've got to get that uh, right if you want to put a good measurement system in place. Got it. Thanks, and I'll just uh, go down the question list from uh, the participants. Sure. Uh, Lakshman, Lakshman uh, uh, feels uh, uh, the, the presentation was excellent, and then he's quite happy with you providing a good perspective on CFO's role and innovation. And uh, next is from uh, Anil Sisla. How do you see the chain management to bring new innovative solutions in large enterprises? 
uh, and the impact there of um, such innovation. Yeah, How so I think uh, that's a good question. So it's clear that uh, particularly in large organizations, if you want to bring in an innovation culture, you will need to do a significant amount of change management. Uh, but I think the good news is that companies have done this before. For example, if you look at the whole quality movement, which started say in the 1980s, but then picked up in the 1990s, what you will find is that uh, you know many companies started with pretty low quality levels, but particularly if you look at the automobile industry or even the automobile component industry in India, companies have been able to put in place those processes over time. So yes, it needs to start with top management commitment. You need to have a good uh, sort of roadmap for how you're going to go about making those changes. You need to get people at all levels involved and you need to of course have a good uh, change management process in place. I think there's, there's no doubt about that. And uh, I would imagine that innovation is even a little more tricky than quality management. So your change, change process needs to be even more sophisticated. Thank you. Next question is from Raghuram. How do you translate some of the digital tech to small and mid-sized businesses? Um, yeah, that's that's a that's a challenge, I think. Uh, good morning. Point. Good morning, Professor. I'm here in uh, Canada. It's, it's still pretty early in the morning, so sorry for not showing my face. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's an excellent presentation that you made, but. Um, some of the challenges that I've seen working here in North America across uh, private equity and, and mid-market companies, um, you know, they do talk about, you know, the digital transformation, cybersecurity, and so on and so forth, but they don't necessarily have the same cadence as finance issues in a typical PE. Now, that said, they tend to be regular touch points. Now, expanding further uh, with the advent of uh, you know multi-channel platforms, required analytical capabilities, compat compatibility, plug-and-play systems, uh, it actually have meant that boards and employees have a, an understanding of capabilities such as machine learning, automation, compatibility, and so on and so forth. Now, interestingly, here in Canada, they've started. The government has started what's called the CDAP, a Canada uh, across Canada, Canada Digital Adoption Program. So uh, in a complex country like India, with so many hundreds and thousands of small and medium-sized businesses, if in case the country has a well-structured digital adoption program, I would believe that it would create a, some sort of an ecosystem wherein the large corporations can feed into the, uh, the mid-market and small, uh, small medium-sized companies. So I think that's probably a way forward if in case the country really wants to progress in, you know, the economy really wants to improve uh, in it from, it would probably mean a qualitative leap from where it is today and another five to 10 years ahead, if you're looking at it. So what are your, com what are your comments on that? And then the other challenges that I see is how do you match the technology stack to the need? And then the seamless integration. And we have seen it in the past that some of these technologies have created silos and there hasn't really been a seamless integration. So those are some of the uh, thoughts that come to my mind as we go go, go on this uh, you know, digital transformation journey. And also that we have so many options. How does one select what technology is really useful? Where do you get most bang for the buck? Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, Raghuram, you, you put us a lot of good questions. So I, I'm not sure I'll have the time to answer all of them, but I'll take the first question. I like your first question because that's something where a lot of stuff is happening in India. So particularly on the outward supply chain side, that is on reaching the customer, there is a big government initiative called Open Network for Digital Commerce, ONDC, which has been created. It's now in beta testing. And this is going to sort of work along with our digital payment system, which happens through an interface called UPI. So once this, the ONDC starts working, both in B2C and uh, probably uh, to some degree in B2B, smaller enterprises will be able to easily use digital technologies to reach the end customer. This of course may not address the internal usage of digital technology within the organization, but it will certainly enable these organizations to use digital technology to interface with customers anywhere in India and possibly across the world, 
without necessarily being you know at the mercy of a few large platform providers so i think that's a big change that's happening and maybe you know it's somewhat similar to the canadian initiative that you just uh, mentioned uh, now uh, questions like which digital technology to adopt and you know how to go about this for small companies i think those are challenging issues i'm not sure i have an easy answer to your question we went through a similar challenge earlier when we tried to get the small guys to uh, put in place quality practices it had limited success i would say there were tax subsidies there were gov other government schemes there was some government uh, rebates if you actually went in put in uh, a quality management system and so on. i don't know whether those mechanisms will work but i agree with you i think it's going to be a challenge uh, going forward Mm. Uh, next is from uh, Hanuman Sharma. He's quite uh, uh, happy with uh, the very simple and impactful uh, presentation and on a such a complex subject. And so goes to you. Uh, thank you, Hanuman Sharma, for the uh, Mahesh Kasmuti. Again, it's not a question; it's a uh, compliment. Uh, a very wonderful presentation. And uh, Hanuman Sharma would like to know the person and the picture of your last head. Who's uh, who's there in the last slide? Last slide, I think there was just my last last few. I think I think I think last to last some two or three slides before, in okay. the innovation you have shown some gentlemen, and uh, I think there is J and J if I am right. Johnson okay, let me let me just check. I'm just looking it up. One second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last slide picture was actually me. Why? Not last slide, just two or three <laughs> slides before. That, yeah, that was Shamin Prashantam. Not yeah, Shamin, is, just, just before that, I think. Oh, before, before that, Shami. he's a, a gentleman who was in Johnson and Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, sorry, he's a former person from Coke. He's the Go, Go, Coca Cola Group Director of Emerging Technology. Anyway, uh, Hanuman, I'm going to share these slides with you, yeah. so you can, uh, you know, at your leisure, you can look at all those pictures. Yeah. Uh, Rishi, uh, in connection with Raghuram's question, just a thought crossed my mind, if you will permit, I'll just add. Uh, these accelerators and uh, the incubators uh, development uh, in the universities and in the private sector, they do um, uh, you know, uh, kindle the interest of uh, the smaller uh, size companies to innovate and uh, uh, come out with uh, innovative uh, uh, solutions, I think, which are uh, adopted by the larger entities, uh, you know, in, uh, in a kind of a work arrangement. Am I right, or uh, is it? Uh, it's not uh, the larger ones uh, giving to the smaller ones, but actually the smaller ones uh, they find the solutions in a very uh, nimble fashion. And of course, the failure rate is high, but uh, that's what I gathered. Am I right, or uh, is it uh, something? Yeah, of course, uh, Arun, I think there's a, just like there's a big range among MSMEs, there's a lot of heterogeneity among startups also. Some startups are just trying to imitate other models and maybe adapt them to the local context. Others are trying to come up with genuine new solutions. Uh, in India, for example, only a small fraction of the startups are into deep technology or coming up with fundamentally new technological solutions. Most of them are, on the other hand, adapting existing technology to solve problems better. From an innovation perspective, that's fine as well, because in fact, a lot of innovation that happens in the world is not because of deep technology or uh, you know something that's completely new, but it's also about adapting stuff. I mean, even a company like, like Apple, Apple, even a company like Apple, for example, many of the things that go into an iPhone, uh, Evolutionary new technologies. They've just been very good at integrating a lot of known technologies to provide you a much better user experience. So uh, at times you don't need the fundamental technological innovation. So uh, I think uh, you, have all, you have all types, but yeah, you do sometimes need people who are looking at things in a completely different way and coming up with unique uh, perspectives that people have not had before. Okay, so in, in fact, in fact, it is sorry. Go in ahead, Anuman, very, yeah. In fact, it is very interesting that I was expecting that uh, there would be few examples of Google and Apple and all that, and rather than that, most of your examples hover around Tata Steel, which people feel, and uh, it more connects to me as I represent the 
Jindal is still in power here. And a uh, lot of uh, Tata Steel people we keep in means we I have my senior colleagues from Tata Steel as well as I we keep on benchmarking and studying a lot around that. Yeah, yeah so I know your really Jindal impressive. folks have also done some good innovation as well because I was recently in the CII Innovation Award jury, mm. and there were at least a couple of uh, you know entries from Jindal Group as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was it was impressive to see the innovation around the steel. So what exactly in the logistics would you like uh, maybe a point or two to just share that in the logistics, such as superlative uh, results which they achieved uh, by adoption of technology or by adoption of innovation in terms of just innovation. Yeah. So Anuman, I think we'll take that offline. Huh? So why yeah, don't you so just send me Anil, a mail? Uh, yeah, Thank you. Waiting. Anil Sisla has got one more very uh, important question. I think uh, it's a good topic. Is co-innovation a successful model where startup bring the technology know-how and enterprise bring the domain expertise and customer base to private the idea. I think this is what... Uh... Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you read Shamin's book or even any of his articles, you will find that while this is intuitively quite attractive, in practice, big companies and small companies often don't work together very well because their approaches are different, their risk profile is different, the big company is very structured, bureaucratic, the small company is very agile. So while it looks as though they complement each other well, unless you have a good framework for them to work together, it doesn't always happen. Of course, many companies have been trying this, uh, right from Unilever to Cisco to you know everybody. But uh, the main point that Shamin makes is there's a capability you have to build up over time. And you need to probably have people within the large company who really understand how startups work and we're empathetic to the startup approach. Otherwise, it will be very difficult for the large company to collaborate. So, uh, so the answer to the question is co-innovation works, but, and the but is that you've got to get many of these other things uh, in place. The last question, Narishi, sorry to hold you up. Uh, it's from Sai Krishna. Uh, of course, you would uh, understand uh, the role of CFO. So, and the CFO is uh, tightening the purse strings how it will have an impact on innovation and the future of the firm is the essence of the question, basically. You know, fund allocation against this thing. So when the funds are a constraint or even when there is no constraint, still proper allocation is a uh, uh, prerequisite, I would say, as a, you know, in terms of the performance of the CFO uh, among the various KRAs that are OK. So, you know, they will be... So that, that is the essence of the question. How do we uh, solve yeah, that? So I, I think the, the key point I was trying to make in my presentation today is while the CFO always feels very comfortable when he or she sees very specific ROI numbers with very low uncertainty and so on. Unfortunately, that's not the way innovation works. So you need to therefore uh, you know be willing to embrace some Failure. of the... In yeah, embrace failure. You also have to be able to embrace investments like some of the investments I mentioned to you, which say, for example, people are forming communities of practice. You may you're not going to see immediate output or outcome from that community of practice, but because of the community of practice existing, it might contribute some innovation down the line. So you, there are going to be times when investments related to innovation are not going to show you immediate results sometimes so what you have to do therefore is make sure that these the processes being followed are rigorous it's not so much about the money and the outcome the processes should be right there should be enough top management attention to those processes uh, the top management should be getting engaged in listening to those ideas so that the good ideas are taken forward they need to be uh, good ways of testing ideas in fact testing ideas early is your method of in reducing risk not testing the idea is not the right way. You should test the idea and from that you should be able to figure out whether it works or not. So quick and fast testing is what will enable you to determine whether the ideas have any value. And therefore, as a CFO, you've got to be willing to back that kind of activity. If you don't have the stomach for that, then you will be getting in the way of innovation. Okay, I think the last one is from Sundar. I mean, it's a small one added just now. Uh, any idea on the budget for uh, failure in connection with my question? 
or cyclicalness uh, question uh, or fund for innovation you know you write off you know you are you know you kind of uh, have a compartmentalized approach you know i can allocate take this kind of uh, this much uh, hit i can take you know and this is what i can do max does it work or you know so i it... think the way to do that is to a better way is to take a portfolio approach so you want to have different uh, innovation projects with different investment and risk profiles so you might have a lot of small projects which have limited risk but limited return but they are likely to give you the kind of uh, returns you expect so you might have a large number of those projects at the other end of the spectrum you might have a very small number of very sort of uh, risky but breakthrough kind of projects which if they are successful might actually transform your company but the odds of success are not too good so basically i mean just like you would manage any other portfolio like you would manage a portfolio of investments you probably want to manage a portfolio of investment projects also with different risk reward profiles i think that's the way to look at it 